big venues which were intended to be concert halls for the people had not yet been built. So that in Washington, D.C., for any major performer, for a symphony orchestra, an opera company, anything of the sort, Constitution Hall was it. Constitution Hall had been built in the late 1920s by the Daughters of the American Revolution to host their annual conventions. When the DAR wasn't using it, the 3,700-seat venue was rented to performers they considered suitably wholesome, cultured, and white. Segregation in Washington theaters and entertainment spaces was pervasive, but not consistent. There were a lot of halls that would allow black performers, but not black audiences. And then there were some halls, like Constitution Hall, that would only allow white performers. Howard University decided to test the DAR's whites-only policy, hoping that they would make an exception for the highest paid singer in the world, the voice of the century. The rejection was both commonplace and appalling. Even by the standards of Jim Crow, the insult to Anderson stood out. The head of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, Walter White, couldn't let it go. White had grown up in Atlanta, defined by law and custom as colored, despite his blonde hair and blue eyes. But for White, any doubts about his own identity were burned away when he was 10 years old during the Atlanta massacre of 1906. He writes in his autobiography of moms advancing on his neighborhood, advancing on his family home. That, for him, is a formative moment. Walter White could have passed out of the travails and troubles of african Americanness, if he chose to, but he didn't. That kind of commitment to the black freedom struggle and to blackness itself is really significant. 